So today is June 6, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata extinction nadi. And it looks like, based on the comments, uh, we have a suggestion from Gary. He said, communities have to share everyone's psychology because there's no such thing as a personal problem. And then I responded, also, if everyone's psychology is poorly equipped for collapse or resistance, what can be done to change it? And then Sophie responded, knowing yourself, knowing yourself and knowing yourself. And she concluded saying, communities share everyone's psychology, but they are not aware of it. Results of this should be discussed. Personal mental health issues are everyone's. Do you want to start off, Sophie? Um, yeah, well, I, I, I just, yeah, what my comment, my last comment was um, about the fact that we are, yeah, we are not aware that, we are not aware that we perceive everybody's mental health problems, and it's part of this kind of intersubjectivity thing. I think we, we don't talk, in, we talk too much about individual psychology, and we're not enough plugged into the fact that any human group or any family or like, for example, I take a group of women, when they live long enough together, they tend to ovulate and have their peers at the same time. Uh, this is a thing that nobody has ever really studied or explained, but it's actually a fact. It happens in tribes uh, because people live closely together, and that's why women usually are fertile at the same time. You know, it was it was studied by anthropologists in, in, uh, in so-called primitive societies. So I think when it comes to... Um, to psychology, we, we have the same phenomenon. And it's, it's very interesting that, that Gary says communities have to share everyone's psychology because there's no such thing as a personal problem. And I, I, I really was, um, was uh, yeah, very interested with this. So it would be interesting to discuss that. That's, um, that's I think that's something that you would, would probably enlighten us on a little bit. Yeah, so just on that point about anthropologists, um, just one one further detail to that is that they actually s synchronize their cycle based on the dominant female. So it's not arbitrary. And so anthropologists know that to the point that they, uh, you know, if they on some field trip or something or in a dorm, then they they say, you know, like, ah, oh, I quickly got them synchronized with my <laughs> cycle, you know, basically the dominant matriarch. Uh, anthropologists take pride in the fact that that you know if they the dominant matriarch then all the students or something synchronized with them in a dorm, so uh, it's it's a, a well known thing. But but that leads us straight into this uh, thing about dominance, and that's the thing about a shared problem uh, that there's no such thing as individual psychology or an ind individual mental problem. It's it's uh, it's a group uh, activity. You probably, you, if you are, I always think like if you were on a desert island on your own, if you were Tom Hanks, um, you know, you you've got Wilson there, but you can't really <laughs> have a really uh, psychological crisis like you can say in a family that R.D. Lang studies. 
And now what Argy Lang found was that when you have a family that comes into, say, therapy for some family problem, then what always happens is that the psychotherapist or psychiatrist just interviews each member of the family. They basically f single out one person who has the problem and they focus on that person. And we found out it was always the victim. So they always have some power person, you, often the, the patriarch, the father figure, is causing all the mayhem in the house. But what happens is the psychiatrist, who's also a power figure, will collude with him to find the problem in the, the person that ha copes with the power um, dominance worst of all. So in other words, the victim. And then the rest of the family falls in to make it one individual's problem. But it's almost definitely the wrong person because the person that's victimized and suffering and showing all the worst symptoms is the person that is causing the, 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 the social dynamic that, uh, that they originally come into the clinic for. Uh, they the, the one that's, that's contributing to it least. And I think today still they don't, they don't recognize that, that. And this goes all the way into our bigger society where you, you have this structural system, you have this dominance hierarchy, and then it's causing the structural violence. And then people at the bottom, the weakest members of society, they're taking all the stress. They're committing suicides. They're becoming addictive. And then those become social problems. But the social problem is the guy at the top. It's not the guys at the bottom. They're victims and showing the symptoms. And so what we do is all these programs. Now, you know, the, the same thing is happening where this, this guy, you know, all these shooters and stuff, this guy in Belgium and all this, they're saying, well, we need all these more programs. There, there's, I just posted something in Tucson where they, they're having an epidemic of suicides in kids in school. And so they're going to do more programs. It's like, no, the programming is the problem. But they will not focus on the pe person causing the problem because they're a power figure. And that's where R.D. Lang found. But, that's, yeah, what, fascinating. What that's fascinating that it's the dominant um, in the group that is determining. Um, it's fascinating. I, I must read more about well, this. But this is yes. this is so damned important um, that that in our culture too, because they they recognize our culture recognizes and values um, dominance and psychopathy and just straight out bullies. We admire them in our culture, and so they get off scot free. But it it goes all the way down to this very interesting experiment that shows you this in baboon troops. So uh, this this was something that's well worth looking. They should teach this to kids in school, I think. But it's the study about violence um, in baboons. And the story is that the, an anthropologist in Kenya was studying this baboon troop. Baboon troops is very, very stressful in a baboon troop. Baboons are not very nice animals. Um, the social life is, is very stressful because they attack each other a lot. And they have dominance hierarchies, male dominance hierarchies. Now, what happened in this one group was it got uh, too close to this game reserve and the safari reserve that had a rubbish dump. Um, the dominant males in the troop, they got hold of meat that had tuberculosis, and baboons are very susceptible to, to tuberculosis. Because they were the dominant ones that basically, you know, stomped on all the others to get to the meat, it turned out that the dominance hierarchy was decapitated. The most aggressive, vicious ones were wiped out. Now, what happened was that the troop turned almost like bonobos. And it became a, a matriarchy, the matriarch's rule. They stopped all this vicious behavior. They started grooming each other. And, um, and now the males... Uh, normally get ejected from the troop and then they you know go and join another troop the amazing thing is that decade after decade 
it actually established in the culture of the troop. So that I think 30 years later, the, 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 the troop was still like a bunch of hippies. And what they found was the new aggressive males that came in with all this shit for brains baboon culture, it, they immediately dropped it as soon as they got into that, um, that group and they found they didn't need that behavior. They found they could get groomed with, <laughs> without being vicious. They didn't need any of that kind of dominance hierarchy. And it persisted. In fact, it's still persisting to this day. So they I use it as an example. I think you wrote that in one of the things you posted a while ago when you were starting to show pieces of your book. I think you 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 used that that I'd forgotten. Thank you for bringing that back. That's a very interesting uh, a very interesting observation. The implication for that is is because we're intelligent enough. To, to make these inferences, we are intelligent enough to implement them ourselves. So we in, we we have the self awareness to create our own culture, and it, or if we did a culture where we just pop a cap in anybody that's dominant, we would have that culture. We we would have the culture that everybody wants. So it's so the secret to social change and to living in a kind of a utopia, without um, you know that's not dysfunctional is to basically pop a cap in those guys. But we can't do that because we're a bit too nice and we're a bit too... So, so basically, the reason why we can't have nice things is because we're not prepared to basically go to Brubaker Arms and do the necessary on these bullies. But they're, they're, all, you, all the bullies are unreformable, right? There's plenty of evidence that you cannot reform them. That's what's wrong with the social movement. That's why, you know, just talking to Eric and stuff is that the, I think there's a fundamental, especially on the left, which is nice and mammalian brained and stuff. And they cannot believe that you can't get through to these people by showing compassion and being nice. And you know, Eric also in, in that um, full spectrum resistance talked about John Brown and John Brown's rebellion where he his, his slave rebellion failed and he got hung because he, he was too nice. He basically, all the guys that he captured, he, he allowed them to see their families and he gave them food and he, he tried to show them, you know, slave owners, how, what, that he had in prisons. He tried to show them what compassion was like. The net result was he just wasted time and a posse rode in and basically surrounded the, the slave revol revolt and, and ended it. But if he hadn't have been so nice to those guys, if he just shot them through the head, they would have been, you know, the slave revolt might have succeeded. So the, the danger is you do a John Brown and you say, well, I'm a Christian. We've got to, you know, forgive and let's see if they can't, they cannot reform themselves. You've got to get that through your head. You need one bullet, one bully. It's the only way. But basically, what we've done in our culture is we've been too domestic and too permissive. So we've been too nice. And that allows these bullies to, to have free reign in our society. Now we're too nice to do anything about them. So we have to, what we've done is we've overlooked a necessary weeding that goes on in indigenous societies as they weed these guys out with prejudice. And we've neglected that. And so basically, we, we are too soft now. To do the weeding, and so these guys run rampant through the domestic, uh, the domestic culture. But now, now the missionaries have arrived in the groups that you talk about. So, so Christian values have probably entered the. You know, it's 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 a it's an, an Christian it's, values have promoted psychopathy. Yeah, that that I agree on that. But we've all been we've all been brought up with this. We've all been brought up with this, all of us in the group. Yeah, so, like, so it's, I think it's necessary to go back to to study this, to study where we went wrong. But it's 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 not pleasant to do it because it's challenging to have these harsh truths exposed to us, and we're like, "No, please say it ain't so." <laughs> it's like, "I'm sorry, man. This is the way it is." Yeah, it's 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 very difficult. I mean, even though I know intellectually and and, and a lot of uh, I've questioned this story of the the story of the baboons and uh, has stayed with me when I read it months ago. And and again, every time we repeat, yeah, the psychopaths are there. You want, but we you're struggling with a an enormous uh, baggage. 
an yes, enormous. But, okay, so, so let's go forward on this conversation that we could never get to with, with Eric now. Is it, if you go back to that, what it implies is if you think of all these guys, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, all these psychopaths, Biden, a lot of them, they all psychopaths. Bojo, Angela Merkel, thank God she's going to step down into the psychopath retirement. But all of these guys, the guys in Skull and Bones, the Bush crime family, all of these guys, psychopaths, they live psychopathic culture. It's inbred in them. They are irredeemable. Now, you, you cannot go on this flouncy notion that we can all have, you know, all the nice people can get together and resist these people. It's like, no. It's a very, very easy problem. They carry on doing what they can get away with. So they, they feed on niceness. If, if anybody had, a, if any culture started a, a, a program of targeted assassinations, you wouldn't have to go very far down the list before you would stop fossil fuels in their tracks. If, if any one of these guys, these guys are going to do geoengineering, they're going to play with the planet, and nothing will stop them. But it's easy. It, it happened in the 1970s. They started down this path, and immediately it changed everything. So it happened in the 19th century. This is all airbrushed out of history because they don't want you to know what the kryptonite is. But anarchists... Do you think that, you think that was behind the, the Red Army faction and the German... Uh, the Germans, um, you know, who tried to start to to attack uh, big fire, big bankers, and stuff like that. Do you think that was that sort of thinking that was behind yes. them when they started the yes, assassination? But, yeah. Yes, but you see, what 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 uh, look what happened with Aldo Moro and stuff like that is everything changed. Everything changed in in Italy. Now, what immediately the other side rallied to say, "Don't look at all the fact that they actually achieved their goals." Look at how terrible they are. Look at the children that suffered innocently. Look at the innocent people. that They try and show you the blood. They try and show you how horrid these terrorists are. And, they, and so then, then they, uh, you know, they completely wipe over what Aldo Moro did and how many people wound up on a meat hook. They don't talk about that. But then they, they, they you know, they embellish, her, you know, basically the mammalian brain, shock and awe. Look what these people, and then they try and get them and show them, you know, kind of Braveheart style, you know, hang drawn, caught them, quartered them as exemplary things of what happens if you go for kryptonite. This is what happens to you, and so that's that's the the continual thing. But what gets airbrushed out is just how damned effective it is, and so what happened in the 19th century was. All the Klaus Schwabs and stuff, you know, all the oligarchs of today, all the billionaires and uh, were, were aristocrats in those days. What's hidden from us today is the propaganda of the deed came very, very close to making a universal republic out of the world. So anarchists came very close to abolishing states worldwide and abolishing borders worldwide and instituting republics. In, in fact, they did. In fact, they, there's only a few left, like Sweden and Belgium and the UK, and they, they're just symbolic monarchies. So in, in essence, anarchists, anarchists of the you know, black hat assassin variety actually did change Europe to the extent that the, the, last, the last action of propaganda of the deed was actually Franz Joseph and Isabella Esmeralda, whatever his consort was. But but the he was he wasn't even the emperor. He was basically the 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 heir to uh, the imperial throne from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But the the Black Hand, were anarchists who killed him, assassinated Franz Joseph. The repercussions of that were so huge that it swept Europe into war, into a war that we still really haven't got out of today. But but that I mean. We're talking two guys. One guy called Princip basically ha changed the world forever. This uh, is so powerful. It's so damn powerful uh, that people say, you know, oh, it makes a cycle of violence. Oh, it doesn't work. It's like, no, the kryptonite works. The kryptonite works. It's just a question of when you get to it. So you don't want to go and seek it out. 
but we have to get out of this nonsense that you can be pacifist and have your cake and eat it. Because all you fucking little liberals that think you're going to survive this, you know, the four horsemen riding in and you're going to get a planet and it's all going to be nice and it's going to be a Green New Deal, the psychopaths reform themselves and we'll have social justice. It's not going to happen. You don't get that shit for free. You, you get that shit for blood. So basically just get over it. We're not going to get there in any other way. Lord Hugh, what about... Um a psyop like the threat of kryptonite would that even be sufficient yeah you see you see the ultimate thing is a psyop so you don't really really want to use violence right but you know it's it's like why would you want to hurt people that are innocent uh, victims and and you, you know you know there's, there's going to be collateral damage so it's it's unconscionable to do violence, and, and, and it's only justified because you're forced by the psychopath. It's it's the psychopath psychopathy that forces us into doing it. Once we've done it, then we can put it behind us. But it's like Eric was saying in this in the previous interview: is we don't get to decide the tools. Is the 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 enemy? It's like a duel. The enemy gets to decide the weapons. If you, we're challenging them to a duel, so they get to choose the weapons. And they're psychopaths, so they've already chose. It's money and guns. So they said, "Okay, it's money and guns. All right, you chose. We comply. So you are complying with their dictat that it must be violent." We are trying to avoid violence. Violence is expensive. Violence is cruel. Violence is evil. And violence is fucking horrible. But they are choosing violence, so we have to respond. You, you, you don't... See, this is what's so wrong with what everybody's doing, is they're thinking that they have a choice because they're liberals and consumers, and they've told... You know, the self-esteem movement has told it's all about them, and they're so full of their self-importance that they get to think that they choose. No! You basically die or fight. The, the psychopaths determined that. It's, you, it's, you don't get to do consumer choice and save the planet. You save the planet, and everybody that is going to survive is going to survive the bloodiest fight the world has ever seen. So it's, it's like it, it, it would be fine if the psychopaths put down the weapons and said we'd be nice, but refer back to the top. They're never going to do that. They would because they would rather die than lose their position at the top. So therefore, they have to. They decide it. They have the power, and they decided how this is going to be fought. So, so you. So, but having said that, the, the it there's no point in you can't say do what the allies did in in the allies. Okay, let's look at, say, the Allies in World War II. The Allies started an area bombing campaign. It was a terrorist uh, act. It was designed to terrorize Britain, I mean, terrorize Germany, because Britain didn't have the ability to strike back at Germany after Dunkirk. So it was done by this psychopath called Bomber Harris. And he decided most people had the conscience to say, we are not indiscriminately going to bomb civilians in German towns. Obama well, Harris said, we have to, because otherwise they're going to, you know, gear up the manufacturing capability. They're going to throw all the weapons at the Eastern Front, and they're going to beat Russia, and then they'll come back and hit us. So basically, he convinced them that this kind of Machiavellian um, consequentialism to say that the ends justify the means, and so he started on what was blatantly a program of genocide, which he should have been, you know, sent to the Hague for after the war. But, but anyway, okay, now look at the thing about what they're doing with violence. That, what's so wrong with what Bomber Harris did was that there's no way that Britain could drop so many bombs on, on Germany that they could physically stop their production capacity just by destroying it. So therefore, what Bomber Harris was doing, and everybody knew he was doing, was he was doing a, a terrorist war of psyops. 
and he was using area bombing, and we're talking in Dresden, 200,000 people died in a firestorm. It's one of the most terrible things you can imagine. They did it deliberately, and they did it again on Hamburg. Once they realized how to start a firestorm, they used it as a weapon. So a, half, a firestorm is where you, make a, you do so much incendiary bombing that you start a local tornado, and the tornado basically gets hurricane force winds, but because you, you have this huge upwelling in this fire, if you burn a whole city, you get this huge upwelling of fire, and it starts to rotate. And so basically you get hurricane force when the winds alone can do more damage than the fire and the bombs. But once they realized that, they started using it as a tactic for mass weapons. It was extraordinary evil. But what they were but even with a firestorm, even with say uh, you know NBC weapons with weapons of mass destruction, you can't really knock out uh, people's ability to manufacture. People go underground, they put they have defense, but Germany put all the V weapons and stuff underground. They didn't really bomb Pinamunda into interstates. But what they're doing, they're not trying to do that. They say afterwards that you justified with it, but they know very well what they're doing, and they're doing science. They're doing terrorism, and they're trying to terrorize the German people into saying, you know, we will punish you so badly. You will lose your kids, your relatives. You'll lose your treasured things. They bombed Lübeck. Lübeck was... A wooden town, a medieval wooden town with no military significance. The Germans didn't even defend it because they thought, what psychopath would, would bomb a place of cultural heritage and, and zero military strategy? They bombed it because it was wood and they could make a firestorm out of it. And it was to basically say to the Germans, right, we took out Lübeck. We took all your tre medieval treasures from you know Germany and Hamburg out. So it's basically, you know, you carry on pursuing war we, we will take you down. In, we'll, we'll take away everything you hold dear, and we will terrorize you into submission. And that's what we did. We we're very nice. It was called the Good War. And that's what we did to the Germans. But you, uh, re remember that at this stage, they didn't know about the concentration camps and all the Holocaust, how we justified all that. This was before they knew all that. So, so okay. So, so having said all that, saying... Now, what is so wrong with what Bomb Harris did was to do the same kind of psyops that you have to be more imaginative than that. You have to basically, it's very expensive to do a campaign like that. So you have to um, think up ways to be imaginative and, and do everything you can not to be violent, but, you know, with, with the same uh, result from the psyops. So in a lot of ways, refraining from violence can ultimately have a bigger psychological impact because the threat of violence in, in people's imagination, the threat of violence is nor normally greater than the actuality. So in some instances, if you follow through with the actuality, it actually does diminish um, the actual result. So that's another reason why you don't want to be violent. But uh, you, you can't be perceived to be pacifist. Uh, otherwise, you lose the, the element of, of fear. And you, unless you can instill fear in these guys, you, you will not get anywhere with the psychopath. And, that's, that's, and they will sacrifice. But I, do you remember the campaign of bombing in, in London by the IRA in the 70s? And um, they, started on a, they started on a pub where the, the army guys used to go and usually celebrate. And that's their first bombing. And that's from that bombing came out the famous Guildford Four who were arrested wrongly, were accused by the, the government of being the perpetrators. But after that, the same group continued a series. That, that was a bloody, uh, that, there was a lot of people killed, a lot of, well, they were mostly military, but there was a few civilians in there too. And they continued a spree of bombings on restaurants and pubs all across London uh, during that terrible winter. And uh, well, terrible it was. Well, it was for the people, and it, they terrorized completely London. But after that one, they always called fifteen minutes or twenty minutes before the the explosion. And the 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 casualties of all these bombings afterwards was completely ridiculous. Very very low. They could have killed hundreds with all the bombs that detonated. But they were always warning afterwards. Uh, the impact was enormous. The guys were captured. Actually, the four, the Guildford four, who were wrongly accused in the first, in the first pub, were kept in prison. They were kept in prison for fifteen years, 
and they had done nothing. But and it's they an knew it. They knew it done yeah, nothing. yeah, yeah. But they they got the guys at the end. There, there was a there was a they got they got the guys and the, but the guys were finally liberated after the Good Friday Agreement, and I I've heard and I've listened to those guys and they're certainly not. Uh, I'm not going to say they're not violent. They're not violent in this sense. These guys, these guys chose violence because it was the only way. They were not bloodthirsty. Uh, they were, you know, it was. It's very interesting to to to, to listen to those guys since they've been. Uh, they they spent a long time in jail. They spent twenty years nearly in jail after that or more. Um, but uh, it's it's it, the psychology and actually to come back to the to this question of. Um, question of Gary about uh, there's no such thing well there's no such thing as a personal problem um, I, I I think that those groups are th those groups are extremely interesting to study because they haven't they haven't and when you listen to those guys their ego is is kind of gone they're they're I don't know if you if you've studied people who have worked who have tried who have um, been an activist in kryptonite. Um, um, and, Nelson you know, Mandela was a case in Yeah, case. Uncle Ted, or, you know, all these, they're very interesting people to, to, to study. They're not, the way they're portrayed um, in, the, in the mass media is absolutely ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. So, so the thing is that these days, the, the need, you see, the need for the governments and the state to to use kryptonite is is much greater now uh, because the world has got more sophisticated and more automated and more electronic so it it means that you don't if you if you actually uh, against it it's more like a swiss watch it's more delicate it's fragile and it's it's easier to sabotage it so the global system is very very fragile and easy to sabotage as we've just seen in, in you know last year but um the alternative is is not is not true uh, they have to get more violent now um because there's more at stake there are more people the people will be more desperate so it, it's we're we're in a position where i think we have to get into the frame of mind that that they will use violence wherever possible we have to have a, a profile a really low target profile so that they don't have opportunities to use violence uh, because if if they catch you or something like that they will torture you basically you you will suffer violence and the but the the opportunities for actually you know doing a drone strike or so something like the they want to do um, diminish as as basically the world gets more online and more technical so what it becomes is more like cyber warfare and the violence is in things like people say well you know if if the grid went down or there was a damage to infrastructure or say anything like that or logistics the global logistics system then people you know the say the media would immediately say oh you know little old ladies died in hospital and they, they would try and get those stories to make it sound like you know it wasn't just against electronic infrastructure or a, against uh, and uh, you know, uh, um, non-personal infrastructure. So they would try and make it personal and try and find a reason how you know this kind of uh, sabotage or something of the system results in personal tragedy, and that's what they would would try and do. But it's all hokum because you know basically the personal tragedy is if we allow the grid to come to stay up. And it'll be an increasingly vacuous kind of argument because if, if things go the way I think it is, which is basically more four horsemen of the apocalypse, and you know you can imagine we'll soon be at war, then uh, you know it'll be much easier to show that taking down infrastructure actually prevents the, their ability to wage war. So you can see there that they they will target you much more strictly because it. It becomes sedition. It becomes um, uh, treacherous to actually go against a country's infrastructure during a war wartime. But that's where we're headed to. We're headed to a thing where, and this is why I kind of grieve. My heart bleeds when I talk to 
these these activists because they don't really understand where, well my dark picture of where I think we're headed but in you've got to do ecological action in a time of war which amounts to insurrection so so you know and and you have to do it on both sides you have to basically do you know what I assume is coming down the pike is that it'll be Russia Iran and and China on one side and it'll be you know Saudi Arabia Saudi America and Israel on the other and so you have to sabotage them all because I don't think we can get through um, you know it, it doesn't work to side with any one particular party and if um, if you know you can't rely on them destroying themselves with, with a war a war would be long drawn out it'd be like the Cold War and there'll be lots of proxy wars in places like Iran and North Korea and <clears throat> and uh, we're getting close to the the point of view where they can start using nuclear weapons and then that genie's out of the bottle once they start using them and they become like tactical weapons people will normalize them and then we'll start to see uh, nukes used routinely as terror weapons so um uh, and so you know you have to imagine trying to do climate activism in that kind of scenario I don't think all the tanks are going to be running on solar panels and wind farms. They're going to be running on fuel. <laughs> and um, the military, I mean, a war is going to burn a hell of a lot of fuel in terms of jets and tanks and places. Basically, the, you see, China has to make it a ground war and make it a long grind because that's that's what the West can't, can't do, that kind of war. China is going to have to make it that kind of war. So it's going to be, you know, lots of proxy wars in like Kashmir and between India and China, and Taiwan, in Ukraine. It's all it's we're gearing up for it. But just like with the pandemic, all the activists went went to sleep during the pandemic, but the greenhouse gas didn't stop. And so you have to think in terms of the fact that in 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 wartime, you've got to cripple the entire system. So, so that's a different world right there. But I think we'd be fools to carry on talking this bullshit, which I'm getting pissed off with, to put it mildly. Over, that it's solar panels and wind farms, and we all work together. It's not going to happen, dudes. We're, we're about to enter severe food security, water shortages, droughts, and you know this is the first pandemic and this pandemic's not over it hasn't even started so so and then we you chuck in financial collapse and then you say like now you start your activism but you've got to get real man it's, it's talking about all this happy clappy you know wonderful planet it's not going to happen man we, we're on the we're at the stages where it's like you know fight fight it's we're at the last stand we're at the end game so it's like we've got to stop this crap about it's all, you know, bunnies and plant a tree shit. It's nobody's planting a tree when it's going to go up in flames and the coming heat waves and stuff. So it's time to get real, guys. It's time to get real. Well, I was surprised to hear Eric saying that the pandemic was nearly over, and uh, he, he mentioned that at the beginning of the interview. He was more or less taking it as a as a fact that we were kind of over it. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just heard also that um, Turkey is completely invaded. Uh, the Marmara Sea is invaded by uh, another sort of slimy um, um, uh, sort of tide uh, all over the coast uh, with a sort of, they call it the, the snot, <laughs> just a lovely name. And uh, it's apparently I've looked at some aerial pictures. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, uh, it's not far from where you are, actually, Hugh. It's, uh, it's the other side, but it's it's not that far. It's the amount of things that are gone completely silent during the pandemic is absolutely incredible. It's uh, yeah. lots of people don't know about it here. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's all rather bleak and stuff. But but the the thing is, you know. I think we should start exploring how other people, this is not new territory, right? This is kind of the norm. If you go back to World War II and read about it, go back to Sarajevo, go, 
just go and see what everybody else is. I mean, I'm Corfu here. The just go and see what everybody else has been through. It's the same. We're just about to go through what everybody's been through. So it's it's not mysterious. Um, it's it's kind of run of the mill. So it's just the thing is like uh, playtime's over. You had a very nice privileged time. I've been very privileged in my life, but it's like time to wave that goodbye. So the very first thing you can do as an individual is let go. Start letting go. Start letting go of everything because you're going to have to let it go. It's basically it's a, what, we, what we're heading for is a long process of shedding, shedding our delusions, shedding our ideas, shedding our religion. A lot of us are going to have to shed our humanity. So you, you, you start early. Start shedding, shedding, shedding. Start renouncing these things and just letting them go. It'll be so, it's so easy to, to let them go in your mind, all your cherished things and loved ones in your mind before. And then you get to the stage where every day after that is, is a gift. So every bit of time you get after that, there's no, like, there's no present like the time. And so once you've let go of everything, while you still have it, it's, it's golden. But you're just a fool if, if you right in the middle, you take things for granted. Like, you know, this all turns out well, and, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going to be intersectional and inclusive and have, um, you know, Biden's going to make some Green New Deal that makes social justice. It's like, guys, forget LGBTQ stuff, forget uh, wokeism and stuff. That's all the kind of privilege you've got to get let go. There's, there's no social justice. You, it's like, it's pathetic. It's just plain pathetic. We're going into something like World War II. Can you imagine people in 1939 going around saying, well, important, the most important thing before we fight Hitler is to be inclusive and to have social justice and to think of the Africans before we start invading Europe. It's like, fuck off. You, this is serious shit. This is a pitch battle. It's not, there's nothing nice about it. Get real, guys. Let that shit go and start to get where, we, where we're heading for. If I'm wrong and we don't get there, it doesn't matter. You'll get to wokeism quicker the sooner you start realizing shit's real. So basically, wokeism is saying to the world, shit's not really real. We have time to worry about LGBTQ things like they, they're equal to the climate crisis. So then you get this debacle like just happened on collapse where you have bright green lies somehow is equitable with, you know, feelings of trans people. In what world are you there where feelings of trans people equal the destruction of life on Earth? In what fucking planet are you on? Let that shit go. And start concentrating on what Derek and these guys were trying to tell you. It's that. See, the lies we're telling ourselves is that there's nothing really going on. We have plenty of time to be, you know, think about gender and think about women's rights and think about toxic. You don't have time for that. And you will get to the place where people think, uh, you know, behave better in terms of wokeism. If you want people to be woke, first of all, say, we're fucked. There's no hope. Instantly they woke. But while you, you know, it's a political issue and we ding-donging this, is you, you're broadcasting the fact that there is no emergency. We have time for all this crap. And so then basically we'll, people will return that crap in your face. If you say like, look, if I came out, if I was the biggest dude for LGBTQ rights and, you know, basically suddenly came into the room and said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. And people would say, why? But you, that was the biggest thing in your life. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter now because basically, we, you know, we're heading into a war. There's going to be a draft and LGBTQ thing doesn't matter. People are going to be raped on the front lines pretty soon. Jessica Lynch is going to be one ten a penny. So it doesn't really matter about you know, pay gaps and shit like that. And then instantly people would be like, oh, no. <laughs> They'd be more sympathetic to gay people than ever they were before. But that's very interesting because that answers a lot of what Mike's question was about um, how people are poorly equipped 
to face collapse and resistance because those are sort of exercises. Are, I've done them before. I've let go of causes when I saw that the one was more important and that our planet is more important than some things I was attached to. And, and to do that with witnesses, to do that in front of people is powerful. It's a powerful psychological tool. Yeah, you see, the, the advantages of a cult is is that if you have a lot of people working on the world and themselves in this group scenario, if one person makes a breakthrough, they all do by kind of proxy. So if you can if you can see somebody change, you will change. But if you can see somebody fundamentally break down and change, everybody does. So so you get like you know everybody in the group for the price of one. Yeah, I, I found that interesting because I always thought there needs to be, I feel like, especially groups like us, um, and we're so spread apart that um, we're just one individual. And I always saw the individual versus the group. It's how can one individual influence a group, you know, and I've always thought about that. It, it's very difficult. I mean, speaking from my experience um, living in a city, there, I, at first, the city is the most vulnerable to climate change. Once things go, most vulnerable to collapse, pandemics, and I see that they're they're in need of this kind of change. Especially, they, it's just inevitable. You know, they need this change is most necessary. So yeah. 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 So so, but you see, it's early days, right? For for us, they can string this along quite a long time. I think. So you have to imagine, you know, extrapolate forward. Today, today we're just a bicycle club. But extrapolate forward in the future where one of us gets arrested or killed or beaten up or, so, you know, basically it's some, and suddenly gets real like that. Well, you know, that, that's, uh, it doesn't matter that we're all distributed in around the world. We, we'll be as close as maggots as when, when that kind of thing happens. So, yeah, it's... And the... Also, don't forget, I mean, I'm just learning what's possible in the new world and on social media and stuff like that. But I'm being impressed and by, by what you can achieve. I thought that it, you had to do it personally. It's like pheromones and you have to be in the same room. I didn't know that you could actually get into people's skin and cross a digital divide. And so but I'm learning that that's, it's, it's especially because people are more sensitive these days and, um, you know, it's there are a lot of lurkers, right? So you don't know. The, a lot of people will sit on the sidelines. In fact, only about one percent of people will will contribute. So you think there are about seven of us, and look, there are about maybe seven hundred members on on you know just lurking around, <clears throat> just um, you know, few few hundred views and stuff on on videos and so. You, you see, all those guys are also uh, part part of it emotionally vested in it. So basically, it, if it doesn't matter if something happens, a change happened in us, it can ripple out uh, much wider to maybe you know hundreds of people. Is it? It's it's strange because you don't really want any of this to be more than like a Dunbar's numbers worth. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you think about it, it has the, you know, guys like Jordan Peterson and that, they have hundreds of thousands of followers. Some of these guys have millions, but you know, this is for this kind of work and stuff. I'm not, I'm not sure it works on that scale. It's, it's, I, I always took it as read that you do this kind of thing in about a tribal level, you know, less than 250 people 150 to 250 people it's it's a small company of people and you don't want to start a religion you don't want to change the world and stuff you this is just you know a lifeboat <laughs> for, for everybody involved um and it, you see and that it's that's that and also the speaking the truth as best you can has strange effects. So it's not just the inter intersubjectivity synchronicity tel telephone, is that we all live in a lie. And if somebody has the strength 
to root out the lie in themselves and admit it and take some pain giving it up and do that publicly, uh, that can have very big effects. I mean, we're talking, you know, I mean, in history, people have done it and thousands of years down the road, there's still repercussions from, from those, those what seemed like simple acts at the time. So you've got to be conscious of the fact that, that if you start to tell the truth as best you can, uh, it has its own power and it can be very powerful and very long lasting. But you don't want to seek that out as a goal. You know, that's against the desiderata <laughs> principles to, to look for those kind of outcomes. You just do right action. And the right action is to try and tell the truth as best you can. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing tonight is just telling people, guys, get real. We're not going to be doing this activism and movements and create movements. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's just not happening. That, that, that is a quaint time and it's passe. It's passe in 2020, right? All the things XR was doing, that was a time that's passed. The, those tactics, those ideas, they all passed, right? The situation has moved on way before that. It, it's, we're about 20 years, 30 years behind the times than the average person as far as I can see. And we have to catch up and get ahead of the curve if you want to, you know, basically save yourself some pain. Yeah, that's that's really good. That's, um, yeah, because um, if we're thinking about I guess hospice, there's a lot of people, you know, if we're, if we're at that level, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Some people might want to change the world. And then some people, maybe they'll think, okay, it's, it's better to just do right action and, and tell the truth as best you can. And I think you hit it in the nail there. Cause um, yeah. Well, people are trying to avoid grief, right? And so it's like, well, guys, 10 billion people dying horribly is the horror of it's going to echo across the Milky Way. So it's like, just start eating the grief now. Don't, don't eat it all in one day. It'll overwhelm you. So the guys that, that commit suicide and do all these traumatic things and stuff, is, uh, is they're overwhelmed. And so it's like, start eating the shit now. Start, start grieving now. And, Avoid the rush. <laughs> yeah. And it, so, so hospice could be the best part, man. It's like, I tell you, the shit show that's been going on has been so low grade entertainment. It's like it can only get better from here. But you, ha you have to get the kind of mindset where, where you, f you find the drama entertaining and not threatening. And the only way I know you can get to there is by ditching your ego. So so if you hang on to your ego, you're not going to have a very nice fairground, right? You're only really going to enjoy the fairground if you're completely reckless and you think like, mm, you know, I'm a kamikaze. <clears throat> I'm just going to enjoy every single moment of every single ride and I don't care if the ride kills me. And if you, if you have that attitude, not only is it less probable you'll get killed, but it's more probable you'll actually enjoy it. But most people will think you're a nut because they think like, how can you be enjoying this? And you say, well, who, you know, who can't enjoy this show? <laughs> it's like you, you, the price of entry is the, your pain at birth and uh, the pain at exit and all the rest is gravy. So it's just like, who can't uh, think they're not getting their money's worth out of this show? Think of what what what, what we do. Uh, think of what we're doing in places like the UK, where, where they trying to amass quantity of life without inequality. So what, the problem with domestication and this fetishization of safety and nonviolence and stuff is you get to this place where quantity of life becomes paramount, and you're not living anymore, and your quality of life is going down tremendously. And you say, like, well, you just give up on some of the safety and security and just, just give up on trying to accumulate time uh, and start living. Just, uh, you yeah. know, that's, that's the price of, of living is 
is giving up on safety and security and nice things. Yeah, and I just want to point this out. Um, maybe Sophie can speak more about it, but um, the medical profession, how they want to extend your life even to the point where you're in a gurney, strapped up by these machinery, these things that help you breathe. And at some point you think that's not a good quality of life. That's, and they promote that or they say, hey, you know, you want to give your granny two more months to live or something. And I don't know, I just find that kind of sickening, you know. You know, you know that you know that starts from birth, unfortunately, because I I started working when I was uh, in um, in obstetrics and delivery wards and in labor wards, and then after that in neonatology and where they were keeping alive tiny little babies that were sometimes twenty five weeks, thirty. That's when I started to ask myself all these questions that you're mentioning now, and I was only in my thirties then. And uh, all through the time I've worked in medicine, I've seen this creeping all the time. I've abandoned all that without any regrets, without any, I mean, it's just, it, it's in every aspect of the health system. You cannot, you cannot, of course, no. It won't happen if somebody comes in with a broken leg and you're gonna fix that leg. That's, that's, still, that's still fantastic work, do you know? Or it won't happen if you, if you do a delivery and you know you help a woman you do midwifery uh, you do normal but it's every i'm talking about this with my neighbors with my family the people who are still working in the health system and they all they i all i can do as you were saying earlier the right thing is to tell the truth and i just come out bluntly with what what we're talking about do you really want to live until 90 or shit life why don't you want to die at normal at the normal age of 70 or 60 or whatever uh because what do you want what do you want quality quantity it's the same I, i'm having this language and most people i'm talking to are people who used to be my patients and i used to just sometimes be <laughs> obliged to, to i had to sometimes um send them to hospital or or under the pressure of algorithm and as a medical counsel prescribe things that I didn't want to. I have, I have suffered in that thing, but I know now, and I know now I will never, I will never collude and I will never go back to that. Never. And, and I make the people around me very, very aware of that. Um, but it's, yeah. Well, it's so important that you brought it up because this is this is my dark fear. If you don't think I've got enough dark fears, then listen to this one. Because, okay, let's just paint the picture more of what you said about in, in America. In America, it's got to the stage where really they can keep anybody alive for as long as you want. Uh, it's just basically they can keep, a, keep you alive like a steak and just, you know, just... There's so many machines and stuff. So where we've got to is that people are kept alive until they make the decision with their left brain, the alien cortex, to switch off the machine. So it's a ridiculous situation where a third of all the money spent on healthcare in America is going for people in end-of-life care. That means that the doctors know that this person is effectively dead but they carry on trying procedures, trying stuff, doing machines and stuff. And what they're doing is they're draining people's health care and they're draining their bank accounts and the, of, of the survivors. So, so all they're doing is sucking money out of people's wallets because the people cannot let go of that loved one and admit that they, that they are already dead and just being kept alive by machine. So the, so the doctors are they're not really cruel because they, in their minds, they know what the situation is. They're kind of lying because they never tell anybody, this is, this is bullshit, you might as well switch this machine off. They never say that. They always leave it to, to the family. And the family just carries on trying stupid shit, which the doctors go along with um, because it's profitable. And then basically they, until they drain the money, and then basically when, when the family has drained all their resources, they've drained their health care and their medical insurance, and then they're finally ready to let go. So basically a third of all medical uh, treatment 
money spent in on healthcare in America is being flushed down the toilet for no reason other than the family cannot accept death. Now that's that situation, but here's where it really gets dark. What scares the bejesus out of me is we're rapidly getting to the stage where where that applies to the whole planet. The planet can get to the stage where it is effectively on life support system, and they can keep it alive with a dead planet alive, just like a dead person on the, in, in an ICU, they can do it indefinitely with, ge with geoengineering. It, it's, it's artificial. They know the planet's dead. They know they'll never be able to recover it. But you can almost keep it just doing all these kind of end-of-life stupid treatments. Uh, just carry on doing that indefinitely with the planet. I don't want to get to there. And the reason why we must sabotage the system is this vision that I have of we don't want that amount of control. We don't want, you see, we've got too much control over the patient's life. We, we don't, all our pursuit of healthcare and people's fear about death, and so they like every new procedure that they could do, every breakthrough in healthcare, everybody thought it was a good thing. Because now we're living longer and stuff like that. But we're getting closer and closer to the place where everything is controlled and managed to, to the point where we're only alive because we don't elect to switch a switch off. You don't want to get to that. It's a nightmare to get to that. To have to make that decision. There are some decisions that need to be left to the fates. And we've got to a position where we where we, we can't beat the fates, but we 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 can't concede to them either. So we're in a stalemate, just like a patient in an ICU. And the, the planet is getting going to get there with geoengineering. So they're going to be keeping the planet alive. And they're saying, like, we can do it. This is agony. No one's enjoying living under a, a climate managed by geoengineers. It'll be hell. You'll watch the seas dying. There'll be pH would be would be wrecking the phytoplankton. Then they'll be altering the pH. It, it, it's basically an Orwellian dystopia of infinitely horrendous proportions. And and they'll be in a position, we'll all be in a position where you say, we can end it any time. We can just stop geoengineering and the, the pain will end. And no one will want to do it. No one will want to flick the switch. No one will want to basically uh, end, end life on Earth. No one will want to carry on geoengineering. We'll be exactly in the position where all these families in America find themselves with the healthcare industry. And what is obvious for what, what everybody will do. We'll just go on and on and on till we've drained all our resources. Nothing else can happen other than sterilization of this planet. And that's where we're heading for. So what we need to do is to take that delusion of control out of our hands. Is We, we need to try and end this system before we have the ability to keep the planet alive on a life support system. We need to get to the place where either the planet lives or dies. You see, one of the things why we've got to this position and why people get to this with the healthcare industry is selfishness. You see, you're not, you're not supposed to look after your life so much. It's, it's an aberration to value your own life so much that you will drain the finances from your family and uh, while you sit there in a terminal condition, you're supposed to give up some of your life and pass it on. And now none of these people will do it. We've got so selfish, you know, we celebrate LGBTQ rights. And I'll tell you what's wrong with LGBTQ rights is that it's a wrong not to, to put yourself first and not to procreate and pass some of your life on to your kids. We, we are genetically designed, all living organisms are, to sacrifice some of themselves for continuation of life of others. But we got to the stage where we're so selfish to our own life that we'll do anything. We'll, we'll bankrupt the, the, the planet. We'll bankrupt future generations. We'll bankrupt all our loved ones and our families just so we can squeeze out a little more of the shittiest quality of life that you can do. And what you're you know, supposed to do is give up your life for the uh, for others. But you know what the Inuit used to do, and you probably all the Eskimos now they used to call them when I was young. They, when the elderly passed a certain a certain age, 
the elderly used to go away from the group with um, a skin of some animal to sit on and let himself die on the on the ice because he was not going to be any good to the group he was going to drain their energy their their space it was going to pollute probably their igloo and he just it was just in the culture you just left and you went to sleep in the cold and the snow and that was that was in most indigenous cultures in most indigenous cultures so of course so Jared Diamond tells the story about these guys who, um, in Africa, I can't remember which tribe it was, but but anyway, one of these ethnic uh, peoples in, in Africa. And the same thing is they, they left this guy with a gourd of water. He got too sick. He's, you know, old guy. He's ready to die. So they leave him under a bush. They know, they're nomadic, so they have to keep moving. So they leave him to die under a bush. And then, you know, basically he didn't die. All the vultures came and sat on the tree above him, and they all shat on him, and he, he, he wouldn't die. And the vultures are carrion birds, so they wouldn't eat him until he died. But eventually he got better. He got up and came and caught up with the tribe. The tribe afterwards, they were mean to him. For, from then on, they, they called him, you know, vulture shit. Because he was, by the time he got to them, he had all this vulture shit on him. So they called him vulture shit guy. And they were really mean to him because he didn't stay there and die. He came and caught up with the tribe. And then, you know, he could put the tribe at a lot of risk. So it's, yeah, it's pathetic. We shouldn't be doing this. Are we, I bet you see, look what's happening. We, we're not, we have a chance now that, that we haven't passed all the tipping points and we can pass life on to future generations. But that's a closing window and it's closing very fast. So instead of talking about, social justice and stuff for that, we should be talking about how can we sacrifice ourselves now so that some people, the future, can carry on. And nobody's talking about that. But we should have a militant, militant culture that whenever any shit like Monbiot or some fuckwit gets on TV or something and says like, you know, but we need social justice, say, Fuck social justice. What are you doing so that you die and people can and may allow other people to live? And unless you're having that conversation, shut the fuck up about solar panels and wind farms and quality of life and people in the global south. It's like we're all gonna die if you don't fucking say what you're gonna die for today. Tell me how you're gonna die so that others can live. Otherwise, shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear about greed new deals. That's a powerful sermon for today, eh? I must have been ticked off by, <laughs> by the previous meeting. I, I can, I can, I am ticked off by the previous meeting. I can, I can almost hear the lie. I can hear the falsehood, the denial. It's, 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 it swims like a miasma. It's, it's, it really I think gets we all me. Do. I think we all do here. I think this is why we're there, because we, we 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 can you know we can speak the truth and because the parallel with geoengineering and 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 keeping people alive is so powerful because it's the same denial of death and people who are denying the death of our planet. I mean, people who are denying what they have in front of their eyes at the moment. It's it's this, exactly the same thing and this. It's it's but you you have to you have to, to, to you have to say that you have to say it loud and clear. I hope all the people who are listening to this, the lurkers, the hundreds or whatever who are there, can can just just broadcast this. But you know, <laughs> right? But yeah, I mean, you, dangerous... you were so sad about LGBTQ and I mean to defend Derek and yeah. and Leah and that about trans people and that and say like. It is like, okay, so you're trans, that's very cool for you. But explain to me, you know, what have you done for other people? You you haven't like the fact that you haven't you're not gonna have kids and not gonna procreate doesn't make room for other people or anything like that. It it's bullshit. Well is is like what what have you really done for future generations? You don't give a shit about future generations. That's why you cut your dick off. So basically, if, if you cut your reproduction organs off because of your gender identity, 
it, it's like that's great for you but like what about other people what about other people but well, it's not so only that. It's, it's, it's unsustainable to be to be like that without without the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the medical health system. It's impossible to, like like Derek was saying, um, in the in the last talk that I listened to, that I missed it, but uh, he was saying, well, you know, if you brought up a child, telling him a child who likes to dress up as a girl and why not? You know, he's just a child who likes boy, who likes to dress up as a girl. That's fine. But when you start down the road of intervening surgically and giving hormones constantly, because I have had to prescribe some to trans people, they take an enormous amount of estrogens, progesterone and stuff like that. You know, they depend totally on the industry. As for the surgery, it's extremely high tech. The surgeons are making a fortune on these people. So th th these people are completely a product of this disgusting culture we live in they would not be they, they they're they're just they're nearly artificial they're nearly artificial life because you stop the industrial system you stop the possibility for these people to even exist as trans people they probably have to live as people who have preferences and maybe have to in society adapt like people adapted a hundred years ago a thousand years ago there was always effeminate men and masculine women who in their ways became Amazons or dancers, but they didn't they didn't go for the knife, or if they had to, they were eunuchs for, for the court of the of the harems of the kings. But you know, there was not this that it, it's totally artificial. I, I have the three I had under my in my practice were were, were kept uh, literally as they were with prescriptions constantly, visits to hospitals, uh, substitutes for all sorts of things, and, and also psychological support, because those people went reg regu regularly into terrible depressions and all sorts of problems due to their, due to all sorts of things, probably their previous history, but their stigma, their place in society. So they were taking antidepressants, hormones, um, and visits to, it's, it's just, those wouldn't I was looking looking at these people as a kind of an I, I mean there were people I respected them I liked them they were I knew they lived in the community but they were you know I mean in my family there's a lot of diabetics where the people have lived as diabetics because their insulin was invented in in 1930 something late I think but if they, they wouldn't they wouldn't be my family because they would be dead if they had been born before they'd all be dead at 14 or 20 because they didn't have insulin it's this I'm looking at those people the same way you're just you're just there because there's this big machine behind but you know that's yeah, all yeah right rather than telling kids about how they should be tolerant and stuff is is i would like to see them say like look i don't see that this technical civilization and industrial civilization has much longer to go so do you really want to be a hostage to it because as a trans person you're going to be reliant on big pharma and stuff for and uh, i can well see a, a collapse maybe very soon of of the market system and free market capitalism, in which case big pharma might not be around. I don't see big pharma around in, you know, in the Weimar Republic and stuff, basically churning out high priced drugs and stuff to keep you uh, that, that you might need. So you should be saying to these kids, like, do you really want to be a hostage? Because you're, you're making yourself a hostage to the industrial system, which we need to shut down. We don't need more people, more people dependent on this industrial system as a crime. So we should be going the other way and say, look, we need to get you off the dependence on this, you know, military, industrial, scientific healthcare complex. And, and so is, I would not like to tell somebody that's prepubescent that I can guarantee that the grid and the, the, industrial system is going to be here for the, all the decades in your life. In fact, I'll tell you right now that I'd give that almost zero chance. So do you want to take such an irrevocable step? It just makes you less resilient and makes you more dependent on, on, a, on a system that in itself is in a death spiral. And it makes you also kicked out of the medical profession. Because every, if, you, if you utter this sort of, of uh, affirmation to somebody in a consultation, 
and you say, well, you know, I know you want to be a woman, but uh, I'm sorry, but you know, you're going to have to do it without without uh, surgery and medications because the medical system is going to collapse in a few years. You just that person will go up to a lawyer or it will go up to the medical council and you'll be kicked out of your job. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, it's just like, yeah. Well, you know? I, I, that's that's why nobody <laughs> nobody ought to be a, a doctor these days. It's just too much burden. But I remember the, at one meeting I was asking that naive question of Lord Hugh about consequences to this, um, you know, transgender operations, and uh, he said, "Of course, yes. There's uh, all kinds of medical complications afterwards, and like Sophie said, psychological support." Um, but my my one big thing too, aside from those uh, uh, complications, are it's almost, you know, how one of the things we're always talking about is um, striving to get rid of our egos. And it seems that such a step like that, um, it seems like it's so focused on, on the ego being bound up in your physical or material manifestation on this planet. It seems like being so obsessed with that and that's all your life would be about i don't know yeah it's it's become a political agenda so it's it's outside it's it's cult like now so it's become a cult but i looked at the research uh, of consequences and i found that there were 78 papers there was a meta study that said they had 78 studies on on the results of gender surgery um and they said basically not a single one of them found any negative consequences from having gender surgery at any age, even like little kids. And I then, and like right there, you know, there's something wrong because I know lots of people that are, have regrets from basically being trans. So the fact that anecdotally, I know people that are having regrets about being trans doesn't means that there's some agenda that 78 studies and that's obvious is obviously the only people that do gender studies and long-term impact studies of, of gender surgery. The only people that do that are people that, that have an agenda and have an interest in promoting gender surgery and trans issues. So it's basically the only thing that, is, that can account for such a, such a glaringly bogus result. There is vested interest because those studies are completely there. I've, I've, I've studied that years ago, too. And, and the studies, the first studies that were published that were showing the amount of breast cancer in men who had to take hormones for a long time to become a woman and all sorts of other problems with the prostate of these guys that is left in because you can't take out the prostate even if you cut off the penis his prostate has to stay in so those guys accumulate the problems of female hormones with the problems of taking female hormones on a male. it's just there's problems cardiovascular problems due to the taking of hormones there's there's weight problems there is all sorts i mean i, I could go into a list but all these things have been published let's say when it was not happening so often in the beginning of the 2000s and now you don't find this anymore well you there's no studies of course they do the psychological ones a little bit you find little little papers in in journals of psychiatry but they all they all um, rely heavily on the social pressure to uh, to the lgbt group and you know they say that but it's it's enormous and those people not only are taking uh, the poor people, I feel sorry for them, but are relying on the pharmaceutical industry, but also become a burden to the health system afterwards because they have all sorts of pathologies. And then they, they just, it becomes an, a, a crazy problem. Crazy but problem. It, in previous I can, times. Derek, I feel sorry for Derek and Leah, really, because they're, yeah, they're so, 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 like, right. They're so right where they are. Like. But so in, in previous times, then people knew about, I mean, in Christianity, I mentioned like the Gali and Sibylis, Corybantes and that, that would castrate themselves. But it was known since ancient times and in more recent times, the Scotches. There's, there's a, Christians have always had a problem with self-castration because it's a, Christianity is a death cult. And the primary reason, I think, for the psychology of, of trans is also a kind of a death cult. It's, it's 
a denial of yourself as an organic human being that's going to procreate in a, in a lot of ways. Um, a bit simplistic, but at least I know some people where that's the case. It's a control issue. And so, so but people like the sculptures and the, the Christian cults in, in Russia, they had tremendous trouble with Tsar and stuff. They had, oh, they had terrible penalties for them, but they couldn't stop it. I think that the sculpture is still alive today. But they, they, the men and women that would, would uh, you know, the women would cut off their breasts and the, the men would cut off their scrotum and penis. And um, it, it was a big deal. It was a growing cult. But anybody, you know, in some places, I think in Belgrade or something, that I think the taxi drivers or the horse taxis or something like that, they they were primarily sculptures. And you can see writers talking about them. They say that they look horrible. Sculptures, they have their skin is pallid and kind of waxy, and they're all a bit overweight, and it, it's not nice to touch them. They're kind of clammy and kind of reptilian. And, uh, and so, you know, and they're well-known. I mean, everybody knew since ancient times that they're well-known problems, and one of them is like mood swings, and the other one is like obsession about food and, you know, putting on weight and stuff. So it like they're real consequences that nobody will talk about. You can, well, there's a whole industry of self cutters, especially in the, 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 um, the gay circuit and the clubbing scene is the a large number of these uh, operations are, are done in back rooms by guys who get known as cutters and they basically do it for money and for sexual thrills. So it's a, an element of sadomasochism in it. And a lot of these guys, all they, they want to do is have an orgasm and then have their balls cut off when they have an orgasm because that's supposed to be the biggest orgasm you're ever going to get. And so they get obsessed by this you know, sadomasochistic fetish, which is an erotic fetish of having their balls cut off. And they're not thinking what it's going to be like afterwards living as a unit. And, and nobody, nobody will tell them that. So a lot of people get obsessed by this, and it's, it's a, a sexual uh, eroticism thing, and it's got nothing to do with desire to be a female or anything like that. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, basically it's a kind of a suicide. And, um, and so it's just one moment of sexual thrill and that's their last. And then they've got fucking medical problems for the rest of their lives. But nobody, nobody will say anything about that or expose that culture uh, that's but, going on because yeah, basically it's not politically correct. But you see, Hugh, in the past there's been eunuchs because they were the guardians of the, the women in the in, in the Orient, you know, and in China and uh, in the Arab countries, yes. And there's been the castrats too, who were the, the singers in in big choirs a long time ago so that they kept their beautiful voice so they were castrated so that there were there some famous ones actually who were they were actually revered but all that was happening in a time where there was not an industry where well it's a certain industry but it was very small scale and it was for a certain purpose but the problem i have now i wouldn't go into the sexuality and the erotism of all this thing because i don't understand all this but the, my problem is there's those we have created a group of people who are completely artificially kept alive by an industry that we loathe and that is is dangerous by all its aspects that we've discussed and you can't have you can't advise a young man or a young woman especially a young man now to go into this now at this stage knowing that in a few years he's going to be probably become a, a nothing because he's going to start having beard growing again and hair because he won't be able to take hormones and he's going to have all sorts of problems because he won't have a surgeon to do this or that to arrange this or that. That's the job is to tell, as Hugh said, young people now, you know, you're not going to have support from the medical world in a few years. Everything is going to go around. Don't do it. It's not for any ethical reasons or opinions. It's just practically you're going into you're going into into a failure. Yeah, you, you might have to me? move an urban environment. You might have to become a refugee and stuff. Just don't think your your white privilege is going to last uh, through through collapse. So you you want to make sure that you you've got less problems, not more. 
But anyway, the whole thing is stupid because they keep on going on and on about the plasticity of the human brain. Well, the human body is not plastic. So, so why does the human body take the hit if you have gender dysphoria when the human brain is easier to change? The human brain is plastic and you can change it. So why don't people change the brain? Why is that so politically incorrect? Because the body's not plastic. You do damage to the body. So, um, but again, it's the alien cortex. The alien cortex gets an gender identity. It's well, what it really is, is that, that um, the, the alien cortex has an ego. And it, I think one of the reasons why culturally we're having this, this fad of uh, trans and gender surgery and stuff is, is because there's a glow, growing sense in the world that there needs to be transition and change. You can feel that we, we, you can just feel in the air that there is this almost pregnancy, this, this pregnant pause just waiting for this kind of cloudburst and transition into something new. And it's expressing itself in all these perversions of transition. Because what I'm saying is like the alien cortex is always substitute in inverts. And so basically we're about to go through a transformation of the alien cortex. And it doesn't want to do it because it's an ego and it's going to die. The end of that transformation is its death. But so what it does is it substitutes. It says, no, transformation means that in essence, you're a woman. And so you've got to basically do a gender transition. You say, no, that's macchio. That's a false imposition of transition. And then they say, well, we're going to do a transition into the singularity of the nerds. And then the Christians do, well, we're going to do the rapture. And everybody's got a, a fake substitution of the transition. And they're all in denial of what the transition is. The transition is that part that's making all these fucked up impositions and doing these uh, suppositions where they say superposition saying, well, you know, it's a gender uh, transformation. It's an ego transformation. And so it's no, it's an alien cortex transformation and the alien cortex dies or we go extinct. So get the transition right. It's an intellectual psychological transition and it has the characteristics of psychosis. So we're all going into psychosis. There's no avoiding it. We're going in through mass psychosis. And the, the way it's fragmenting is, well, maybe my I'll do this psychosis, I'll do that. No, there's one psychosis that makes you survive and that's the proper rebirth into a new world, which is you psychosis. And it's a good psychosis. It's a psychosis where no one gets hurt. Your body doesn't get altered. And basically you come out the other side without an ego. You identify then with the universe and you stop being an individual. So the individual is going through paroxysms of writhing and denial and every which way from, you know, every which way to deny that this birth is going to happen. And you say, well, it can be an abortion or it can be a birth, but we're heading for an abortion. So get over it, man. Just do the right kind of psychosis. Well, that maybe ended that conversation. <laughs> Should we end it? Uh, we was it say <laughs> oh, I was going to say something, but you all probably covered this already. Um, one of the things Lear Keith said about what's going on with transgenderism, I think it's right. And I think you went over it a little bit, Hugh, is people are trying to conform to the gender roles of the culture because they feel the cultural pressure, I think. So if, you know, a guy wants to do more feminine things, the culture tells him he, he must be a woman, then he identifies with that. And yeah, so I think that's a that's a big part of this issue going on. Yeah. Yeah, but it's getting so faddish. Uh, at the moment, it's just people are doing it just because it's exciting and interesting. And it's yep. a bit boring and basic to be cisgendered. Terrible place to get to. I mean, but that's where you get to when it's all about egos and individuality and me, 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 me. And they're like, oh, well, 
this is where it gets to. We're going to do this with at a genetic level. We'll soon start tinkering with our genes to conform with that, and then you're like, "Oh, mother of God!" Yeah, you can't it's tinker like with your genes. To give you X chromosomes and Y chromosomes, dudes. Yeah, that's that sounds like the road to cancer. And another thing is like that video of Joseph Campbell I put up. Uh, stories are about getting the mind in line with what the body wants and i don't think the body wants to be sliced up with a scalpel <laughs> yeah i mean uh, surely a normal body wants to generate wants to procreate it's like come on man surely our minds cannot have become this dominant we, we need it basically i would love to talk to miguel quest because i can't imagine what he would say about a subject like this but it, 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 he's skirting on the edge of it that basically our, our, you know, the emissary and the, our master and the emissary, which is emissary I call the alien cortex, it needs to be subordinated. It, it, it cannot, we, we don't want to carry on anymore with it supreme. Have you tried to reach out to Ian? He's, because oh. I've seen that he's given interviews to some little stations and groups, I mean, little channels on youtube that don't have many yeah of you so i don't think his book is sold much so i think he might be happy to yeah I don't i've know. been i've been in contact with his um with his assistant and he's interested in having um an, a meeting with us but um i'm still setting a date so looking yeah yeah since you're talking about ian mcgilchrist so just wait yeah it, it's coming <laughs> yeah it's, there's so many people that see a similar thing from different angles. Um, but yeah, the, it's it's just moving too slow. It's just, I mean, no, I'm not mean the McGill Christ interview. I mean, the, the, the fact that, that people's psychology is not moving fast enough. The, is, is the events in the world are overtaking human psychology at a very fast pace and i think in in terms of the, the eric mcbay uh, conversation is you need to take that into account people think think of activism like a static target and they think you, you know it's it's going to be like it is today in 2019 and you know we'll just you know act, do a bit of activism for subsidies for you know uh green tech and stuff and it's, it's like guys one thing you can absolutely take to the bank is it's not going to be like it is today. It's probably going to be a lot worse, and shit's been going. Shit is going to be coming down the pike much, much faster than you'll be able to cope with it. So you, if you've got some plan for activism, you have to take into account that you're going to be doing activism on a high wire with you know basically the waves smacking your face one after another after another. It's going to be a brutal beating. So it's it's no longer MLK and stuff. It's like, okay, if I if I get MLK, make him run across a hot fire with bullets firing left and right, beat him with a stick, and then you know basically uh, make him do a triathlon afterwards. It's like that's the kind of activism you want to be doing, but not Gandhi. <laughs> it's, it's like okay. this 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 is Gandhi in a liquidizer. Tap dancing is is way. This is more like activism today. So yeah, you just everybody's just got to shake up their ideas and just move on because just I just see everybody so static, so so behind in their thinking, talking like it's the seventies and stuff. It's like, guys, the seventies weren't even the seventies. So just move on for fuck's sake. We can't be doing nineteen a rerun of a shitty rerun of the nineteen seventies in the twenty twenties. We just cannot. Just just go go and read up on the nineteen what happened in the nineteen seventies. Just don't repeat all that shit. It failed miserably in the nineteen seventies. We've got far less time than they had in the nineteen seventies. Just you know, get over that and just catch up to where we're at. And it's 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 dire. The clock is ticking, man. So anyway, that's my message. Better go out on that one, then. <laughs> um, I don't know if any everybody knows this, but the, in the United States, the hospitals are run by corporations, so not good. Everything's run by corporations now. 
Mm -hmm. Governments are run by corporations. Armies are run by corporations. And that's a good thing to think about. Think, think in terms of, okay, before you set out to do, yeah, let's do a campaign of banner drops or we, we can stop fossil fuel infrastructure. Stop that shit. Imagine this scenario. We're at war, right? Basically a proxy war in Iran. There's a draft. They're sending people to the front to keep them off the streets because they're bread riots. And then basically you, you say, now you start doing activism. Now, now what can you achieve in that environment? Because that's more like what you're going to be in. And say, like, it's a corporate environment. Basically, a lot of the people will, will be Blackwater and uh, all of these kind of corporations that it will be as a semi-corporatized army. So it's, it's not just the U.S. military. There will be legions of legions of mercenaries. I don't call them mercenaries now, but they, they are. So think of, think of a corporatized war with uh, chucking in a bit of food insecurity and hyperinflation after, say, a collapse of the financial system. And now start talking about what you're going to do to reduce carbon and methane and greenhouse gases. That's far more realistic. So that, start with that. And first thing is banner drops get you 10 years in jail, hung upside down, whipped on your feet. So don't do banner drops because you don't do banner drops during wartime. I'm telling you that much. It's insurrection. You fight, but you don't fight like a fool. <laughs> so there's a bit of food for thought. Definitely lost all the XR crowd on that. But, but anyway, if, you look, if you're part of XR UK, you're on an island with 64 million people. It only feeds half of them. You are a refugee crisis waiting to happen. Just remember that. Just remember that. I, I got a quick question. This is about the, that XR symbol. I saw it. The other, uh, I watched a film on Friday. The 10 billion film. Do you remember that with Stephen Emmett from yeah. 2015? Yeah. It was in there as a subliminal message. Near the start, he starts talking and then it's showing all footage of, you know, because he's going through, you know, layer by layer, the problems with the human species. Now that guy was, I don't know, is he like a scientist in the Microsoft Foundation? But he's looking at um, existential threat that the human species face. And that fucking symbol was there. It just popped up on the screen. And I was like, this is 2015. Yeah, yeah. Watch yeah, it. That it's on YouTube. You have to pay for it, though, which is a bit annoying. Um, but, yeah, yeah, it was there in bold. It was just like, you know, and it was a subliminal because it just flashed up in between all these pictures of, uh, yeah, you know, uh, like no. and chaos and climate change. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, so, no, that makes sense. So it's it's a street artist called. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, he's an English street artist. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's not Banksy, but it's somebody like Banksy. It could be Banksy, but he's not claiming it. But, yeah. But it's... anyway, that was started in 2011, and that guy shopped okay. that symbol around a lot to try and get people to pick it up. No one would pick it up. He did get some success, so that's where it must come from. But. It, uh, it right. eventually in 2018, he loaned it to XR. So that, but there's one of the Greta videos I did. I went yeah. over that symbol, and uh, it's really interesting the the background to it. Mm. Yeah, it just yeah. had me thinking. I just suddenly thought, is this like you know the sort of foundations of XR being infiltrated, or the sort of is XR just the whole? Not you know, at that stuff. stage. Yeah. No, not at not at that stage. That was too too early. But I mean, certainly now they're completely infiltrated. I think. But yeah, it's it's. But the thing is, it's not too late to movement jacket back again, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> These things can can be turned. But yeah, I, I Gary mentions something about making sigils for each one of the desiderata and I, I kind of snowed him a bit by saying it's an excellent idea but you know I, I as usual 
uh, uh, gilded the lily a bit and made it too much of a huge task. But, <clears throat> but sigils and symbols like that, uh, basically what I was talking to Gary about was, you know, vesting the sigil. So you, you basically put a lot of psychic energy into it and, and work a lot on it, its emotional uh, development. And it, it can be very psychically powerful after that if you do that. So these symbols are very, very powerful. Mm. And, um, I mean, the, the XR symbol, the, the name Extinction Rebellion and the symbol, X, the XR symbol is pretty much all the organization is. Uh, that's, it's nothing more than that. But the, a symbol like that is super powerful. So, yeah, I just say that because we should, at some stage, if we get the art going, we should invest a lot of time in sigils and the meaning behind those things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, thinking along those lines, you guys were talking about Easter Island last week, I think, and that had me thinking about how, I remember watching a documentary about all of that, you know, the Birdman cult and how, even though they knew they, you know, the last person to chop the last tree down on Easter Island, they must have known, like, you know, this is crazy, but they did it anyway to build some something for for one of those statues or whatnot but i always remember in the film it was like this is like an allegory or a, a metaphor for earth you know it was an island in the middle of the ocean and they used all their resources and they had nothing left and you know they died <laughs> it was like earth an island you know in the middle of the solar system it you know so it's but, cool. but similar. consider consider this if you everybody's a bit of a magical thinker and stuff now imagine if you were ashamed. Hmm. You could have saved all those people, even with sigils and, and symbology. You just basically invest people with a religious symbol or something. And you you can carve it into every tree. You say whoever cuts down this tree will be cursed, and then basically, you know, a sigil like that could save the forest. You know, it's it's that's how fucking stupid people are. But but. The fact that they can be stupid one way means that there's hope for them being stupid another. So that's why, you know, like I mentioned, cults to Eric McBain got a very negative reaction. But it's like the people don't like to admit that they all cults, they all suckers for cults. And so, so shamans are outside of the cult system, and they use cults to manipulate people, just like states use um, use psyops and, and all these programs to manipulate us. But people are super manipulator, uh, easy to manipulate. So, but for for the righteous outside the skull and bones and all those, you know, Neoplatonists, that uh, you know that it it's a salvation also that we could also save the planet with those symbols. I mean, just yeah. just think how powerful a symbol is. If, if you got the XR symbol and everybody knew that that okay, you just set up this as a known meme in the public, that the XR symbol, if it appears on some machine, that machine will be blown up within a week. Just just imagine how powerful that is, you know, putting XR symbols on things after that. Yeah, that's did, nice. Did you say, I like that. Sorry, did you say a shaman was outside, a, sh a shaman was, was outside the cult so that he could manipulate them? A shaman is, he, is supposed to have shed his ego so somebody who's shed his ego, um, what's his situation vis-a-vis -vis cults? Because he can't even, I mean, I, I'm trying to. The, to the, so the cults, the real purpose of a cult is for re rebirth, spiritual rebirth. Yeah. So what the shamans would do was they would take people on a magical mystery tour, basically. They, they would take them on, on the journey Across the sticks, basically, just uh, through death. So they would take them on, and they would do it in a thing like a cave or something like that, with the idea that death is really a rebirth. And so you would go through this ritual death, which was, in psychological terms, it was a complete death. And then you know they would lead people out. After that, they revenants. They have been born again, um, because because they've died, but they're still living. Then. They, they are revenants. But you see, the, the shamans have already been through that process. They've already met all the demons and been through all the psychology. So then they can lead other people through that. The, the, it, it has, 
I don't want to label to labor too much the thing about all the paranormal stuff, but I, I keep on pecking away at it. It's hugely unpopular, especially on the left. They don't like paranormal shit. <laughs> but the problem is you have to get into that stuff. And the reason is that's all inside us. So those things will manifest. On this journey, those things will manifest. So the fact that I'm playing the role of a shaman means that I have to introduce those things to you because you will see them. If if you look at, say, a, a Buddhist priest and doing a, a, um, a, a funeral rite, in part of the Book of the Dead and the Bardo, they will tell you that you will you will see all the demons you will see and they say know that they are all projections of your own mind so that all of these paranormal things i what i believe is happening with the ufos and the us navy and stuff they are the projection of our own mind we're manifesting these things and it, the more you go into this the more you will manifest them just remember that they come from your own mind it doesn't make them any less real it's it's straight out of that harry potter thing where Harry Potter says, like, Professor, is this all happening inside my mind? And he says, of course it is, Harry. Why should that make it any less real? And that's exactly the way it is. You'll never separate out what comes out as a hallucination of your mind than what really exists outside. So just forget yeah. it. Just say it's all just those ghosties exist. You're going to meet them. And then basically just uh, shaman can tell you what to do with each one of them. And I can I can do that when when you're ready and you want to know, especially if you start seeing <laughs> seeing things, then I'll tell you what to do and how to deal with each one of them. But just Thank whenever you. you're ready. Tom, sorry, I, I interrupted you, Tom. Sorry for that. Now. <laughs> no problem. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> well, did did that exhaust? I I feel like. I'm wearing everybody out. Did, did, did I exhaust all the questions for tonight? No, there's too many and it's been so long. It's, it's, we're going on to another subject now. I think we need a break, all right? But this yeah. that could go on forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean... One, I one day we should just go for eight hours straight like, like David Icke. <laughs> <laughs> 24 well, hours. I do want to say something you guys might find interesting so when i was in uh boot camp like the first or second week when i was in air force boot camp like the ec monitors entry control monitors screwed up and had me on ec duty for a week so a week straight by straight i got no sleep and like the sixth or seventh day of that week when i was doing the 40 minute run i had like a semi out of body experience where everything turned into a haze but my body was on autopilot so i was still running and I saw hundreds of wolves running around me. It was fucking trippy, and I will never forget that. Yeah. Yeah, you see, and you'll never separate out whether they really were there or not. Because, you see, it gets exactly. weirder than that. If you, yeah. you can see things like that, and you can see... You, you can tell yourself, yeah, I'm just imagining things, and it was a trippy experience, and so the, the wolves are not there. But you wait until other people see it and shit then, then you fuck. There's nowhere to go after that. So, yeah. No one knows what the hell's going on with the human mind. No, I tell you, no one knows what the hell's going on anywhere in this universe. If anybody thinks they know what... I mean, I'll tell you what's not going on, but I don't know what the fuck is going on. And what's not going on is what all the scientists and Michael Shermer's tell you. So I'll tell you, definitely that isn't what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, we'll never know what's going on, but it's still pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just you just have to bow down and worship it. It's just so fucking amazing. It's just, it's just divine, glorious. So, it's, you know, it, it's, I mean, how, can you think of anything better than something that you could study it as much as you like? It, it, and it would just yield new and fascinating insights and it would never stop so i believe science is infinite and these these idiots are idiots because they think science is finite you say you stupid idiots you don't yeah. know your own subject it, it's the never-ending story and this culture is trying to have the last page or the last word and you can't do that that's fucked up <laughs> 
Yeah, but, but the great part about it is that the attempt to do that is also part of the grand fucked up story. So you, yeah. at some stage, you even have to accept the, the ignorance. Right? Yeah, the, uh, the, the grace and the failure. Yeah, the grace and the failure. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's such a cool story that there are Michael Shermans that are fucking dumb enough to close the book on nature. And it's like, oh, man, this is going to work out to be the best play I've ever seen. <laughs> the, of the success, the success is failure, the failure is success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he closes yeah. the book and then has an experience that makes him question everything. He's like, "Fuck! I need to open that book. Where'd that book go?" <laughs> yeah, just just when you nail it all down, it'll explode in your face again. And that's like, what could be better, man? What could be better? But yeah, it's. I think if, from a point of view of a shaman, is they just have delight in the. Leela and the creation, just in, in terms of the universe, and it's endless, endless subtleties and and twists and turns and stuff. So it's it's like an endlessly entertaining movie. And then at some stage, I think the real death, you know, at the end of the octave, what they call Maha Samadhi or full realization, is 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 really just when you you know you just get tired of the movie. It's just so beautiful and so wonderful, but eventually you need to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you, you need to just say, yeah, this is wonderful and just withdraw. And then that's a full death, right? That's, that's how you're supposed to die. Dying, that, that's the rightness as well. If you, if you die unright, you die in, you know, wanting more life, wishing that life could be some other way, you know, sacrificing life in a shitty situation, you know, basically. All of those things are ways of not living life to the full, not draining the lees on life. So it's um, it's, it's a pseudo life. And But full, full ripeness is appreciating that, how fantastic and diverse and all the possibilities in infinite possibilities in, in the, in the universe. And then, it's just, it's just pure love. I mean, we're part of the universe, and here we are observing the universe. It's just we, we're making love to ourselves by observing the universe. And on that note, we better stop. <laughs> yeah, we better stop. Um, monkey brain and cue, or he's going to be there all night, never get any sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we better, we better, we. We've got too much, I think, in this last part. So we better give it back to the universe because you don't want to get attached to it. You don't. We're trying to get rid and break away and release all these attachments, and we're not trying to gain. <laughs> we're not trying to get more attachments. So let's, we might have got more attachments in this last one. So let's just give it up. And the way to give it up is to just consciously fall still. Breathe out. Let all the desires, the clinging, the acquisitiveness, all delusions that it might be some kind of progress or insight, just give them up as complete folly and ignorance. Boom, Paramatma Nenama, Piti. There we go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, Everyone thank have you. a good thank week. You. Thank you. Have a nice week. week. That was great. Yep. Yeah. Have a nice week. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.